Ooh. Well, hi guys, and welcome back to Not Another Bonsai Channel. So, in that little intro that I've just done, you saw me unpacking this little box, and inside this box is a little tree, or a tiny little tree actually, it's a seedling. So in here, if we just take this cap off, just like so, let's put that to the side, we can see we have two little seedlings. Now these two little seedlings are actually blue spruce, and um, seeing as I don't have any blue spruce currently in my collection, Dan from the Bonsai Project kindly sent me the two of these as a thank you gift for sending him a whole bunch of different seeds. Now I'm not sure if you guys are subscribed to Dan's channel, he's over on the Bonsai Project. I will put a link just up here to his channel and also a link down below in the in the description box below. But um, what I thought I'd also do is he has put together a few videos where he unboxes the seeds and he's shown you how he's sown them and, and what he's planning to do with them. So I'll show you some quick clips of that and then we'll come back and work on today's project. Hey everyone, welcome back. You've just caught me in the middle of reading a letter that I received from Gavin at Not In The Bonsai channel. Uh, he's actually sent me some seeds, which I'm quite excited about. There we are, black birch, silver birch, red maple, and There you go guys, that is my mammoth seed sowing mission completed. So yeah, that's great Dan, um, all, all the best with germinating those seeds, I hope they'll work out for you and uh, yeah, thanks again for these little blue spruces. Um, they're only small now but I'm sure in time if I look after them and uh, you know, give them a little bit of TLC, they should grow on and become really nice little bonsai trees in the future. Probably have a way to go before they become a tree, but yeah, thanks a lot for these, buddy. Um, I really do appreciate it. Right, so what I wanted to do in this video is just uh, go through some of my trees and and uh, just explain what I do for winter, what trees I bring in, um, you know, how some of the indoor trees are doing, and uh, my different techniques for overwintering some of these trees and just how I prepare for for winter. I feel a bit like a teacher this is like, right class, so listen up to what I'm about to tell you. So if I just give you a quick tour of some of these trees, the sun is right behind me so I'm sorry if there's a bit of shadow here but these are the birches just in here we have silver birch, Himalayan birch and um, uh, paper bark birch. Um, you know and these are all grown in just in here, Th these are all over winter just fine out here, I'm not going to do anything with that. This is a pyracantha, again, that can stay outside, no reason why that won't or can't tolerate the, the winter temperatures. And, and down here, it doesn't usually get that low anyway during the winter. We might touch minus 10 as nighttime temperatures, but that's about as low as we'll go. Uh, this is a, a Japanese maple that you can see the leaves are beginning to dry up and, and I would imagine in a short time it will start to drop its leaves. But again, that's another one for outside. We have the beach. Uh, these leaves will soon will soon, will soon uh, turn brown and uh, will stay on the tree for a little while, while up until next spring because that's generally what beech do. Uh, the rowan here, that, that'll be fine, that can just stay out here, that's not a problem. The cotoneaster just in there, that'll be fine. Uh, just in here, this is the hawthorn, again that will drop its leaves but it'll be absolutely fine. Now the Chinese elm. Right, so with the Chinese elm, um, 
traditionally, when you go to buy these trees, they will be sold to you as indoor trees. And indoor is um, really a false name because they, they aren't, you know, they aren't indoor trees. No such tree is an indoor bonsai tree. Um, you could argue that ficus generally won't be able to tolerate some of the temperatures down here in the south of the UK, especially during the winter. So they will have to be bought indoors during the winter period. But that doesn't mean that they are indoor trees. You know, I think this is a, a misconception that a lot of people have. So what do I do with this Chinese elm? Well, what I do is I don't bring this in. And Shakara, you know, a lot of people go, oh my God, Gav, you know, well, what are you doing? You, you, you have to protect your Chinese elm. Well, I, all I do is I stick it in the greenhouse and we've cleared, we've cleared out the greenhouse. So a lot of these trees are a little bit tender and they won't be able to handle frost or some of the, you know, they can handle the cold temperatures, but they won't be able to handle frost. I just put them in the greenhouse and it's an unheated greenhouse. Um, so they will freeze. Um, but this Chinese elm, I've had this for about four or five years now and every winter I let it freeze and it, it, all of the leaves fall. It's a completely, you know, it, by the time you get to January, February, it's a, a complete, a, a complete skeleton of a tree. But I can guarantee you, provided you have a healthy tree, come springtime, so maybe April of the following year, you'll start seeing thousands of little buds popping on this, pop, popping up on this tree. And by the time you get to late, late spring, it'll be back in leaf and it'll be looking like it is now. So there's really nothing to worry about with, provided you live, provided your, your wintertime temperatures don't get too low. If they don't get any lower than minus 10, you should be absolutely fine putting these in very basic protection and just avoiding frost. Freezing temperatures are fine, but avoid frost. So this has got me thinking about the, let's just put that in there. This has got me thinking about the Zalkova, which is this one here. So if you've been following the channel for a little while, you might know that this tree uh, was purchased from Roger over on Roger's Bonsai. I will put a link to his channel in the description box below. But um, yeah, we did a bit of a, a, a well, he put a, a, a video out saying, Get, you know, make me an offer. I made him an offer, he accepted it, and voila, I ended up with this Zalkova tree. And as you can see, it's a twin trunk. But um, this, but as far as winter is concerned, you know, this is the first winter that I'm, I'm going into with this Zalkova. So my thinking is, why can't I use the same techniques with this as I do the Chinese elm? Now, um, I'm basing that on the fact that many people down here have Zalkova trees or Japanese elms growing you know, quite, quite um, magnificently in their gardens. And you know, they don't dig them out and bring them indoors during the winter time, they just let them do their own thing. They could argue about the roots and um, the roots might freeze and it might kill the tree. But my thinking is the Chinese elm is in a small pot. I have gradually acclimatized that to the conditions down here over the last five years. And every year that loses its leaves, but the leaves do come back in springtime. And what I'm finding is at the moment, the leaves on this Salkova look, they don't look that great. And I, I'm thinking that by allowing this to go dormant in the winter time, allowing all of these leaves to drop from this tree. I, again, I'll, I'll put it along with the Chinese elm in the greenhouse and we just let nature do its thing, let the tree go dormant. And I, I'm more, more hopeful than not that the, you know, come springtime of next year, a lot of buds will come out on this tree. And before you know it, it'll be back in leaf and looking nice and lush come next, come next summer of 2024. So if we just put the Selkova back on the far side of the table, I know a lot of you will be watching, watching this video, asking about what is going on with this. Now this is a Dawn Redwood and it looks more like a bush than a, than a tree. Um, but my idea with this is just to let it grow. And you know, some of these branches are really, really long. They must be a good, or well, I'd say probably about 20 odd centimeters. That's probably about about seven, eight inches, you know, so they're really long branches. But what you'll find with the uh, Dawn Redwood is when it goes dormant, it will drop all of its uh, little leaves or leaflets or, or needles or, or whatever, you know, you, you like to call them. And a lot of this will 
drop off. You know, the leaves will turn a nice golden color and then it will drop off. And uh, all you'll be left with is the bare skeleton form of the tree. So all of these big thick branches you can see here, we have another one here, another one there. I'll see the top part. And if I just spin the tree round, you can see we have this branch here, that one there, and a few more back here. So these will be what will remain. So what my plan was is the worst time to prune a tree like this is now. Now I'm filming this video in the middle of October, actually it's the end of the first week of October. And yeah, this would be the worst time to prune this tree. Now the reason for that is all of these trees that I have in my collection are preparing to, to go dormant. So what is happening is the sugars that have built up from the leaf, you know, in the leaves from photosynthesis are gradually being pulled back down the stems, back up these branches and into the trunk and into the roots. So the worst thing you want to do is at this time of year, come along with the pair of shears and start cutting these branches back. Because what you're going to do, you're going to take away all of that, that energy that the tree will later pull down and store in the trunk and the roots. So the best thing to do, if you would like to start a tree like this, is wait until the winter or early spring. Because by that stage, you will have the skeleton form of the tree. You can then see more of what, of the, you know, you'll be able to get access to the tree and see, you know, where these branches are coming from and to be able to style it a bit better than when it's in full, you know, flush of, of green, as you can see now, or leaf, as you can see now. And uh, you'll be able to style it a lot better. And when the tree is dormant, usually that is the best time of all to do hard pruning uh, to a tree. So you can do your big trun uh, trunk chops in, in the, in the winter time. Um, now the risk there is rot. So rot is a big issue and it's a big uh, problem that you have to navigate around when it comes to making any hard prunes to a tree. And this is one reason why in bonsai we prune our trees in late winter, early spring. Why? Because we can't, we could, uh, in all effect, prune our trees in the middle of winter. And many people do, and uh, they have great success. Others like to prune their trees or their roots in the autumn. And again, they have great success. But by and large, the, the more accepted rule is that we prune the roots of a tree in early spring or late winter, because you, you're giving the tree a chance to heal those wounds. So what that means is, if I get my chopstick back, if we made a hard prune to this, this tree, say, say you wanted to cut down the size and we wanted to make a big chop in here. If we did that in winter, say in the middle of winter, we would have to protect the top of this because over time, you know, with no energy going up and no growth happening in the tree, this top section would rot. Now, if that's the effect that you're going for and you would like some dead wood and everything else, then fantastic, you know, go ahead with that and you end up with a great tree. But more often than not, that's not what you're after. And you're hoping for that section, that cut point to heal and new shoots to take over and create a bit more of a tree-like form with your tree. So yeah, that, that is why we, we, we prune our roots or prune our trees in the late winter or early spring, because the energy will soon be coming up those stems uh, into the leaves and will heal those wounds that we've just made on the tree. But there is a little way around this trick, and that is you can protect your trees. So what you could do is you can prune them a little bit earlier than early spring. Now, if you did prune this tree in midwinter, all you have to do is worry about rot. So if you put this somewhere sheltered, maybe you put a bit of cut paste just on top and you protected that wound, from things like frost, and uh, you avoid any water getting to that point. So you keep it out of the rain, you keep it sheltered, like in a greenhouse, an unheated greenhouse, then what you'll find is by protecting the tree, it will gradually come back into its growing form come the spring, and you should end up with a, with a beautiful looking tree come that springtime or the summertime. And that's what I do. And down here in the south of England, I repot all of my trees in late February, early March. Now for many people, that's a bit too early. But for me down here, what I do is I repot my trees and then I put them, I keep them sheltered, I put them in the greenhouse 
and there they are protected from frost. They might experience some cold temperatures, but that's absolutely fine. Usually in the greenhouse, it does get a little bit warmer sooner than out here in the open, obviously because it's a greenhouse. And it kind of wakes them up and kick, kick starts them and gets them going a lot quicker than the trees outside of the greenhouse. So that's just a little trick that you can use. It's one that I use and it's, it's really paid great dividends when it comes to, you know, getting these trees on their way as little bonsai trees. So we just take a little trip over to the greenhouse and I just open up this door. We can see we did, during the summertime, we had tomato plants and uh, cucumbers just on this far side, but this, I'm now filming this in October, so all of that is gone. We just take a step into the greenhouse here. Might be a little bit echoey. We can see just down here, just, uh, just down here. I have this cardboard here just to act as a bit of protection. Uh, we'll need to find a better way to hold it up because it is leaning on the, on the plant tray there. Let's just prop that like that. So these, these are my seed trays. So they've just come down here. You can see these are all of the seeds from Matt and Jay over in America. Um, so we have sugar maples, box elder, junipers. Uh, for uh, th these are oaks from Florida. Um, I don't think Jay knew what they were. And these are round oak. And again, I don't think Jay knew what these were, but round oak and Florida oak is what I've called them. And they're in the seed tray. If you just go over to this one, you can see these are some of the seeds I've collected. So we have pyracanthus in this one, we have cotoneasters in that one, we have Swedish white beam in that one, we have a spreading cotoneaster, which were those, uh, those green berries that I collected the other week, and then we have milk flower, which are another type of cotoneaster. So when the temperatures do get a lot colder, what I'm planning to do is bring the table that I have outside, I'm going to put that just back there. I'm ha I've, I have, do have some black sheeting, so I'm going to put that up. Um, just in front of this window here, create a bit of a, a black backdrop and I should be able to do a lot of my filming in here when the temperatures do drop, drop and it gets a bit colder. So we're just spinning around and we take a look at the other side, we can see all of these will be quite happy during the winter time. We have amelanchias back there, a couple of silver birches, these are willows. This is the hazel, this is getting bigger and bigger by the day but that will drop its leaves and will tolerate the winter just fine. We have some Sitka spruces just in here, they'll be fine during the winter. We have a Japanese maple just down here. This is the um, this is the bald cypress just in here. Uh, this is a uh, what's that? That's a jasmine just in there. That'll be absolutely fine. We have some more bald, cy bald um, cypress just in there. Uh, ah, now this one. I oh, see. So you might remember if you watched some of my previous videos that I tried to air layer in a paper bark maple or an asagrisium, and. Uh, I used the bag method, so I just took a bag of sphagnum moss, made a slot down, slit down the middle, and wrapped it around the uh, standard cup, or well, uh, just scraped away some of the bark and just wrapped the bag around that. So you can see I have two coming on here. I originally had three, um, and that, the other one was on this one, but that branch died, the leaves turned brown, and it just shriveled up and died on me. So I cut that off, and I kept the bag, and I've used it on another tree. And that other tree was this. So you can see I've put the same bag that I took from the Acegrisium on this, used exactly the same method, scraped away some of the bark, used a bit of bonsai wire just to twist and tie the bag on just to keep it on. And um, yeah, let's see if we can get two trees for the price of one. So this tree here is a, a Tamarix. It's a Tamarix Ramos Sima, otherwise known as a Pink Cascade. Uh, never, I've never grown one of these before, um, so I thought I'd give it a go. I saw it in a garden centre. It's only £4.50, £5 around that region, so it's fairly cheap. So I bought it, bought it home, kind of a, a wispy little tree, not a lot to it at the minute, but I've um, seen as though it's quite tall and I thought maybe, you know, one of these little branches on the side might be able to take off and become the new leader. I thought if I could air over it here, get another tree, then... Uh, that's, you know, where's the harm in that? And I could get two trees for the price of one, which, you know, if it works out, would, would be fantastic. So I've been thinking a lot about this Halloween challenge that I have running at the moment, and this is the NABC Halloween challenge. And if you don't know about it, I will put a link in the description box below to the, the challenge video that I put together. Um, but the basic idea is all you have to do is create a horror themed landscape. It could be any tree, any species of tree, any design that you wish to do. It could be a single tree, a group of trees, a forest, 
but the, the whole aim is just to create something that's a bit spooky, a little bit creepy, and uh, it's just a bit of fun around this uh, Halloween period where we can turn our trees into something a bit more macabre and a bit creepy. So for that challenge, I've just been going through some of my trees and uh, trying to decide which one would work best for this Halloween challenge. Well, you know me and how I love exploring the woods. Well, I've recently headed out to a brand new woodland that I've never been to before and it had some rather spooky elements to it. So I had an old abandoned railway bridge, had some other kind of creepy elements to it that really gave me some good inspiration for this Halloween challenge and for what I'm going to do. So I took my phone with me, I filmed a little section and I put that together in a little montage and I thought I'd share that with you right now. Well, hi guys and welcome back. Well, here we are on another woodland walk and this time this gets a little bit creepy because just up ahead there's an abandoned railway bridge. So here we have the abandoned railway bridge and you might have seen this in one of my latest short videos but uh, yeah, this is a, a bridge that must have been here or been standing here for you know the last decades and decades and decades and uh, it's not been used anymore all brick built right in the middle of this forest but just spinning around can show you this this pathway going through the forest here some magnificent trees most of these are sycamores down here you can see there's a creepy little area just in here you can kind of imagine you know uh, sort of homeless people maybe even uh, using that as shelter in the evenings or night times Oh yeah, you're right. And uh, you can see there's all uh, graffiti all over the walls here. Uh, there's yeah, willow there, but there's certainly are willow trees around here. But you can see it's all brick built, very echoey in here. And uh, yeah, this just stands here in the middle of this, this woodland. So, uh, so when you saw me filming that bit inside the, you know, just underneath the bridge, uh, there's a guy, there's a guy sitting under the, the other one of the dark areas on the other side and he was smoking so that's probably why he heard me say hiya because I wasn't sure who he was or what he was doing. So if I just pan upwards, this is kind of a macabre scene. You can see the sun is right behind this tree so it's a bit awkward. But uh, you have this sycamore tree going up here and there's a rope dropping down. Now I'm sure these are for swings and nothing more sinister but yeah how how weird, you know, a, a rope is just dangling from that branch coming from this sycamore tree growing from the side of this bank. And deeper into these woods I go. Now, you wouldn't have seen these, these woods before my channel because these are new to me. I do like to travel around and try to find different wooden locations. And Arla is a fallen tree in the distance just back there. I'm not sure if you can see it. Uh, maybe I might be able to get a better view if I just come around here. You can see there's the trunk of a tree just in the distance here. Uh, it's uh, another sycamore. Most of these are sycamores and hawthorns out here. But it's a sycamore just, uh, just fallen there, a bit of a trunk that's fallen down the uh, bank just here. Uh, it's all kinds of trees just shooting up, all different sizes, different ages. Uh, there's a strange tree up here that's... Really, the sun is right there, so I'm trying to avoid any glare. The, uh, yeah, there's a branch coming down, looping back, probably rooting in the ground just here. A whole lot of deadwood just up here. Very interesting. Also, if you watched my last woodland walk video where I went out and collected seeds, you might have seen that I, I sort of I found a few of those shelters that at the time I said looked like Bear grill style um, shelters, like wildlife or wilderness shelters that you might have seen in Make an East, an East TV show. And uh, albeit they could be used for such a purpose, I did have quite a few people comment on that video and say, actually, Gav, they're probably for deer, they're used for deer shelters. And it's kind of interesting because up ahead, it looks as though somebody's made another one. Just up here, guys, there's another one of these sort of makeshift looking shelters. And this one is a bit crude. You can kind of see there's a sycamore that's come down here. Uh, the root ball is exposed all up there and comes down here. There's shoots and things coming off of this tree. So yeah, these are all sycamore shoots are coming up here. Just come down real low, I'll give you a better shot of that. Yeah, these are all sycamores, all sycamore shoots growing from this this uh, branch here. You can see most of these. Just like there's this one's broken off just here. You can see a bit of the deadwood just on the end, but if you just take it upwards, you can see there's the exposed root ball. And you know, a lot of people like these exposed root balls that I keep finding with these fallen trees. So, and, and I find them fascinating too. I can't get up this bank because it's really 
uh, it's sandy and that, but if you just zoom in, you can see all the exposed roots. And you can even see that the hole, or so my fingers there, you can see the hole from where it once stood. Yeah, just take, zoom you back out. And that is the full fallen tree. But you can see somebody's just put these sticks and things up here, making somewhat of a, a shelter. And you know, as I was saying, you know, a lot of people left comments in my last video saying that these are actually made for, for wildlife and well, namely deer. So yeah, there guys, there's another one. So many times with these woodland walks, you know, I, I really have no idea where I'm going. I kind of, I just like finding the trails and, and just tracking them through, the, you know, different pathways. I mean, this is quite a wide path that I'm going down now. So clearly it has been designed and, and marked up and made, or it's a man-made path. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to get lost, but you know, I, I love going on these wilderness walks, just to uh, immerse myself in nature and the, the, the sort of wildlife and wilderness and just really seeing where these pathways uh, take me. And boy, do they take me to some interesting places. We can see here, we have the remains of what looks like a, an old concrete bench. Just in here, it's fallen apart. You can see it's cracked and fallen apart and uh, the weeds and everything is all going over, over it. I don't know if you, if you guys are interested in those, um, those sort of end of the world programs. So there's this a program that used to come on called Afterlife. And it was a documentary of what, what, you know, how the world would recover if every human being on the planet suddenly vanished. And whenever I see anything like this, where you see the weeds and plants and ivy and everything else, just climb over uh, objects like this that back in the past were probably well used. And uh, you can see it's just a bench here. So, you know, chances are many, you know, many people sat on that bench. But yeah, here's an example of what nature would do and how it would just, you know, the soil would come down gradually, you know, embed it more and more into the bank. Ivy and many other weeds and plants and things would just go around it. Chances are back when it's been used, you know, this tree here, which uh, I believe is a hawthorn growing up here. That, um, I'm just pan you upwards, I can show you the canopy just up here. But yeah, chances are back when this bench was in full use, that tree wouldn't have been there. So that kind of gives you an indication of when it was last used. But yeah, there is a, an abandoned bench it's just been left there to decay and, well not decay, I mean it's concrete, but you know, just um, dilapidate and um, allow the, well, nature to overcome it. Right, so if we just go deeper into these woods, we can see there's all kinds of branches and uh, sort of small tree trunks laying in the pathway, uh, a bit of dead wood over here. But uh, what I wanted to show you is, in the distance, we have another one of these abandoned bridges. So again, same design, brick built, uh, a bit of graffiti just in there. Again, you know, the uh, that's a slightly wider area there, so probably won't provide that much shelter, but you can kind of see, you know, just in there, I'm not sure. I'll try and zoom in so you can see it a bit better. You can see, you know, that has been dug away. So a little alcove has been dug into the bank. And uh, yeah, that could be a perfect spot for, you know, well, all kinds of, um, well, homeless people to shelter, but also, you know, uh, without sounding like the creature, you've got like drug addicts and people of that nature who use these places, these hidden places in the woods for such purposes. But again, you know, it's all, all graffiti, all this graffiti over here. And if we just spin you around the other side, you can see there's graffiti on that side too. And uh, if we just spin you right around, yeah, I'm tripping over a rock, you can see, yeah, it's graffiti all on that part there. But yeah, this here is another old, abandoned, brick-built railway bridge here in the middle of the woods. Yes, yeah, so that's a really fun place to explore. And I always do like heading out to these woodland areas because they give you a lot of inspiration when it comes to creating deadwood on your trees or maybe just styling your trees in general. And especially if you want to follow nature and the way that trees look in the, in the wild, then what better place to go to? Now you might be wondering, why my collection looks a little bit thin. And that's because I've taken some trees indoors. So the other evening, when I was moving trees over into our conservatory, I went through some of the trees that I now have in there and went through one by one and just explained, you know, their progress, what's happening with them and um, what my plans are for them for the future. That's the evening, guys. So I thought I'd just take this opportunity just to show you some of the trees and plants that I bought indoors. So, um, we can see this is just a glass full of some odd seeds and things that I've collected from outside. We'll move that out of the way. We don't really want to see that. So yeah, th this is where I've now kept, I now keep my Indian beans. 
So you can see these little trees are doing quite well, but I, I don't think these will tolerate the uh, cold temperatures of winter or the frost, so I brought them in. We have some more Indian beans just here. Uh, some more Indian beans just in there. Uh, this is the ficus. I'm not sure if you've seen this tree on the channel before, um, but it's a, a neat little ficus. It's a ficus. Uh, the ficus. Put your teeth in, Gav. It's a ficus microcarpa. So it's just a quick view of that one. Um, kind of a, an interesting shape. There is a nasty scar on that side just there because originally this was one of those. Uh, you know those ginseng um, bonsai trees that you can get with all the the bulbous roots. And uh, I've seen several people on, on YouTube uh, take these and they've cut the, the roots right back and planted it as a big cutting or some have tried to uh, s sort of carve the roots to make it look like aerial roots and they've done different things. But for me, what I did is I just used one of these roots. This is just one of those roots. I cut the, the plant in several pieces. This was the biggest root. I had some other skinnier roots that I used as well. And uh, this was the only one that rooted. So I've planted that in this little bonsai pot here. It's just a basic plastic training pot. And uh, there it now sits. And it's it's doing pretty well. We have some nice shoots coming out from all different angles. It's nice and green. And it's doing, you know, it's doing quite well here in the in the conservatory here. But I did have this outside for some of the, the warmest summer months. But now it's getting cooler. I bought it indoors. Uh, this here is my ginkgo. Uh, this, as you can see, I mean, it's it's poor light because I'm relying on the on the uh, the the indoor light here. But you can see the leaves are quite yellow, and I think that is more of a, a temperature change shock than anything else. And hopefully that this does recover. I've been keeping the soil quite moist, uh, not overly wet, but just moist, and hopefully that will recover. We can see we also have the ficus, the little ficus forest that I did. Uh, you'll find that on my channel that video where I pruned this up and I did a I think I did a, a ficus Friday themed video for that one so if we just kind of get down quite low we can see there's a, some of these are so I know that one on the side that's another cutting that I put in this I think is I think that was one of the originals there's also just at the back here um just I'll wiggle that one just there you see that one at the back that's a cutting just in there and there's also another one just at the back in there so th these are all little cuttings that I I took from the top, so I gave this a prune a few weeks back and just poked some cuttings in there just to see if they take and just to enhance the overall look of the of the forest. But yeah, that's the little ficus benjamina forest. If we just look behind this, this is a lemon. You can see that this, I mean, it, it, well, this is a little lemon tree. And what is was interesting about this is I put I had this outside for a few months, you know, during the, the peak of summer, and it didn't do too badly. Um, it, yeah, it didn't do too badly at all. And then it, we had a couple of rather damp, cool nights back in, I think it was July. And uh, this, this little tree suffered and I had some black spots developing on the leaves. The leaves just didn't look very good. Uh, the tree looked, it just didn't look well. So I bought it indoors. And it went through a slight, a slight period of shock where it didn't really know what to do. But you can see we have these huge, great big leaves that are developing on it. Now you can see the size of that leaf is almost the size of my hand. And it's probably not in the best position because it's right behind this china doll here, but it's in full health. It's looking nice and perky and ultimately I'm just allowing this just to grow and grow and grow and get thicker and thicker. And, um, you know, once we have a thick enough uh, trunk, then I can start playing around with branch selection and, and um, you know, just uh, working on the trunk and creating a bit of movement in it and just developing it as a, as a little bonsai tree. So we just take you over to just behind the ginkgo, just in here. This here is my cryptomeria. Um, I think you saw this uh, a few months back on the channel. And uh, you can see just down below, it's it's quite brown. And it the, the needles on this, or the leaves on this, turned brown quite quickly after I, I ordered this. I ordered it from an online garden centre. And um, I, it arrived, I had it in the garden, and some of these leaves just dried up well they didn't dry up but they just went brown they're, they're still moist they're not brittle or anything but they're they've gone brown and I was quite worried and I actually got in touch with the the company that I bought it from and said you know I think you've sent me a dud or a, a you know a, a cryptomeria in poor condition and you know they were quite defensive about it oh no all of ours are doing fine in the garden centre it must be your environment and your conditions so um you know maybe, maybe it was I'm not quite sure but you know I had it in the garden for a little while it did put on some nice green you know, some nice green growth, and you can see on the tips here, they're all nice and green. 
there's uh, a bit more green on that one got a few little branches coming out the side of some of these shoots here and it's all looking quite good um so now that we you know now that it's somewhat recovering and there is a bit of green on the tips i'm not that concerned about the the lower portion i mean if these needles do dry up and fall off then it doesn't matter too much we can develop these as branches and hopefully come next spring we can start playing around and turn this into a little bonsai tree and just behind this this is the china doll let's uh, create a bit of space so you can see this a bit better so let's take the crypto mirror out of the way so yeah this is the china doll and you probably saw this on one of my uh quite i think it's quite, quite an early video where i repotted this and put it into a bonsai pot so this is a really wacky exposed root system if we just go further up the trunk uh when when this first arrived it was just basically a, a flat cut so it's you could see what they'd done and this no doubt probably came from china or somewhere but they, they probably where they probably grow these by the millions but what you could see what they had done they just grown this in the ground pulled it out exposed some of the roots stuck it in in some poor quality soil cut off the top and then allowed a few buds to develop and grow them on into little branches so over the short time that, that i've had it i've uh, cut that branch back and you can see these two little branches have developed here and here and then so there's a leaf right in front of the camera and it's it's interfering with the focus and then there's this branch here which i cut back and then you have that back shoot there and this shoot just at the front here and there's also a little shoot at the back so gradually i'm just developing this into somewhat of a little bonsai tree and hopefully over the next few months and years that will grow on and, and become quite a nice little tree so then uh, we, we go down to this one here this um in one of my short videos, somebody said, "Is was that a Groot that I noticed? And indeed it was. So this is my little Groot, and I have the rat tail succulent plants um, just in here, just to act as a bit of a funky hairdo. And uh, these these are all growing very well. Um, if, if, you know, I've had this plant for, for years, and, you know, the original plant that I had, uh, I, I must have bought it about, I think it was... It must have been about 10, 12 years ago. I mean, it was a long, long time ago. And all I've done since is I've just pulled pulled pieces off. So all you have to do is quite simply, you know, take a piece off, just like so, and stick that into some soil. If you stick that into some soil, that will, I can guarantee you, that will root. These are some of the easiest plants to root. All you have to do is take that, stick it in some soil, and boom, you end up with a lot more. And that's all I've done here. And I've just done it again and again and again over the many years. And um, that's how I've ended up with this. You know, and it's, it's uh, yeah, a really interesting plant to, to work on. Perhaps not a bonsai, but you could certainly use that as an accent plant if you were, if you were using that as a, as a, um, you know, as part of a bonsai display. So, uh, yeah, just in here, the, but just back here, these are the Dracaenas, uh, just Dracaena cuttings that I have. There's another one just back there. Uh, this is a, just a cutting of a eucalyptus, which doesn't really look that good, but it's still green, so I'm you know, holding it on that one. These were just some indoor, well, they're not indoor, but they were chilli seeds that I planted and just had an experiment. We can see there's a little chilli growing on that, so, if, I mean, I'm filming this in October, so perhaps not the ideal time to, you know, be, be growing a chilli on a chilli plant, but there they are, they're growing quite well. And if I just move this spider plant out of the way, because it's, it's in the way of my my film in here let's just drop that down here and if i put the tray down there too we can see here i have all of these little pots of seeds so if we just uh, take a look at these these are russian olives so these were kindly sent to me by jay over on uh, uh, bonsai's forever he sent me these and i potted these up uh, i soaked these in water for a good three days and i've just poked them into this uh, this cocoa mix it's um, the soil, or the, the media made up of coconut husk. And you know, I, I, I find this works really well. Um, cocoa, cocoa mix, um, or cocoa medium, or whatever you want to call it, is inert. So it doesn't, it's not acidic and it's not alkaline. Um, so it works really well for germination of, of seeds that you're unsure of. And uh, you know, down here where I live in the south of England, uh, it is very, very alkaline. So we, I mean, I basically live on a chalk cliff, so, so uh, it, it's very, very alkaline, and um, 
yeah, when you're trying to grow anything that prefers acidic soil, it can be a real challenge, uh, unless of course you grow it in a pot. Um, but yeah, so uh, but I find that uh, a cocoa mix works really well. Um, yeah, so these are the Russian olives. Um, I've, you know, I'm hoping that these germinate well. Um, this pot here is uh, Kentucky coffee. These were kindly sent to me um, from uh, uh, Matt over on uh, Bobcat Bonsai. See so some of these, and they just pot it up in this little pot of cocoa mix. Over here, these are papayas. Uh, these were sent from Jay over on Bonsai's Feather. So again, I'm hoping that they germinate quite well. We have another pot here. These are Brazilian rosewoods. Uh, these were sent to me by Matt, so from Bobcat Bonsai. So thanks again for them. I'm hoping that they germinate. These are honey locusts. Uh, these were sent from Jay on Bonsai Forever, so I just have them in this pot. And the last one, these are flame trees. So these were sent to me uh, from Matt uh, from Bobcat Bonsai, and I just have them in this tree. So these, this is just a little experiment that I'm running. Most of these, I think, will be indoor trees, you know, over the coming years that, that they grow and develop. But, um, yeah, these are all seeds sent to me from from uh, both Matt or, uh, and Jay over in the US. And I soaked them in water for three days, put them in some cocoa mix, and, yeah, hopefully they germinate. So, oh, and then, of course, I have these two cactus, which I'm not really a fan of cactus plants, but, you know, they, they've were given to me quite a few years back and I've just had them here and they're just growing and doing their thing. You can see this one's on the lean. I'm not quite sure where that one thinks it's off to, but yeah, there they sit. And I've, I'm not really sure what to do with them. I'm not really a cactus person. Um, I've tried selling them, but they don't sell. And um, I can't seem to find anybody who wants them, but, but there they are, part of my collection and they're just sitting on the table. So that guys is a little update on all of the, oh actually, no tell I'm signing off and there's more. So just back here, these are the cerises. Uh, these are the two cerises that were grown from cuttings. These came from Jay over on Zenobi Bonsai. You can see they're both doing very well. Uh, I'd imagine over the coming months as we go further into winter, these will probably drop some of their leaves and, and uh, turn a little bit yellow, but I'm hoping that come next year they're put on some nice growth and, and um, just develop further as little trees. This to the left is, this is a, a type of succulent plant that I've just tried to develop into a, a little bonsai tree. I'm not entirely sure what kind of succulent this is. Uh, now it isn't looking very, very good and it's looking a little bit sorry for itself. And, and the reason for that is all the while I had it indoors, the uh, the little leaves or the little pads were as green as this leaf for the china doll. Um, but I put it outside and it must have, you know, just experienced some cold temperatures during the winter where we did have some, you know, rather cool nighttime temperatures during July, earlier in the year. And uh, this this little tree just didn't like it. And uh, some of the leaves or the little pads turned brown and it, it looks, it doesn't look very good. But I'm, I've brought it back indoors. Uh, it's gradually recovering. Some of the, some of the tips on here are... Are green so yeah hopefully that does continue to put out some nice growth and become quite a nice little tree in the future and if we just go past the the long sprawling branches of the china doll we can see these few little plants again all of these were sent to me from jay over on zenobi bonsai so just in here this is a little um portula carrot alpha again growing from cuttings we have another one just in here that's a slightly different variety uh, this is a sag, is it sagrita, I think it's called a sagrita, I think that's what you call it, and it, it's grown very well, it, has, it doesn't have a bad little trunk on it, you know, considering it's grown from a cutting, you can actually see it's starting to go into flower, which is kind of unusual considering I'm filming this in October, but there it is, it's, it's uh, growing quite well, and um, we just continue to let it do its thing, let it grow and see what we can turn it into. And this here, oh, I'm knocking the elephants out of the way, uh, this here is a Chine, Chinese plum, I think is what this is. And again, this is this is doing quite well. I actually had two of these um, that were kindly sent to me from, from Jay, and uh, only this one survived. The other one turned brown, uh, or it turned brown, shriveled up and, and died. But this one continued to grow. It's um, kind of looking a little bit long and, and uh, spindly at the minute, but... 
I just let that grow, let it develop, let it mature more. And uh, hopefully over the coming months and years, we can turn that into a nice little bonsai tree. And if we just continue to go left, these are the uh, the Mimosa Pudicas. So you'll see one of my early videos. I uh, sowed some seeds and uh, they've all, they're all uh, well, a lot, well, I wouldn't say all of them sprouted, but a lot of them sprouted and they, they turned into these little plants. You can see one's taken off a lot more than the others. That the, the the leaves are closed at the minute because uh, it's night, you know, I'm filming this in the evening. And every evening they close their pads and every morning they open them back up again. And of course these are the trees known as the sensitive tree. So, you know, when you touch the pads, they, they do this, they withdraw and they close up their leaves and, and, and pull back. So really fascinating little tree. And I remember years and years ago, I had one of these as a little plant, but with this, uh, I, you know, for, for as I now have a, a bonsai YouTube channel, I decided to, but you know, get a hold of some seeds, um, to see if I can germinate them and see if I can turn one into a little bonsai tree. And so last, last uh, little plant on this little update is uh, this, this little tree. This is a BB tree and you, you might have seen when I did my August update that I uh, bought quite a few BB tree seeds online and I originally had these seeds in a, in a seed tray and uh, um, what I found was most of the seeds germinated. So for a long time I had, I had um, you know, many, I had, I had dozens and dozens and dozens. What I found is every single time a seed germinated, a snail or a slug came along and ate it. So then I, I tried to, did, you know, use preventative measures. I tried using a, a copper, a copper wire around the edge of the, the seed tray. I tried using like a water canal, or like a water trench around the seed tray. And once again, every time a seed sprouted and germinated a snail or a slug came along and ate it. And it was a real challenge, They're just trying to, and they always targeted this tree or this this plant. Well, you know, ignored everything else, but only ate this. So eventually I, I had three and I tried to hang on to those three and look after those three, but somehow a snail or a slug got in and ate that third one, then ended up with two. And you'll see, it, if you go back and watch our August update video, you'll see that I had two, uh, two little plants when I when I filmed that. But it must have been about two, three days after filming that, I looked at my pot of, my little flower pot of um, BB trees, and I saw that one had been more or less eaten right down to the ground. So as it stands, all I have is this, this little one, and uh, it doesn't look very good at the minute. The leaves have gone slightly, slightly pale, but I'm hoping that that's just an environmental shock and it will recover. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on dearly to this one because this is the last one that I have. When you, when you think that I had dozens and dozens and dozens beforehand, and now all I have is this, it's, uh, you know, I'm really hoping that this one, this one lives. So I've bought this indoors now. It's in here with all of the other ones in here in the conservatory. And hopefully, you know, no snails generally come in here anyway. So, you know, that should be safe. And hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, all of these plants recover well and, and do well over the coming winter. And I can bring them back outside come next spring of 2024. So that's all for today, guys. Uh, thanks for joining me on this one. Uh, it's just a, a fun video just showing you how things are progressing so far, how I overwinter my trees, what my plans are for the future, and uh, just how I sort of care and, and look after my trees. And of course, as you know, I do like going out to the woods. So you know, I hope through doing some of these woodland videos, you, you too gain inspiration and it sort of helps you with styling your trees and, and things like that. And oh, a big shout out to Dan over at the Bonsai Project for sending me those little blue spruce seedlings. I really do hope that over the coming years, they turn into some magnificent little trees. They're, they're only small now, but you know, in time, I think they will grow. And uh, you know, with that, I think we'll wrap this video up. Well, thanks again for joining me. And as always, take it easy. Until next time, have a great day and I'll uh, catch you on the next one.